Okay, good morning, everybody. I'm Stephen Buchanan um, from the Registration Directorate at ECA. So I'm going to talk about the first two phases, which is knowing your portfolio and find your co-registrants. This will be followed by Eva, who will talk about um, get organised with your co-registrants and assess the hazard and risk. And then the phases five and six will be dealt with in the training after this that I think many of you signed up to. So phase one, it's about knowing your portfolio. So what we advise here is make an inventory of the substance that you have, that you buy, that you, you make. Um, and then for those substances, you would need to define your role. REACH applies to, REACH registration obligations apply to manufacturers and importers of substances. So you need to decide whether you fit into that role. And then also you need to check if a substance itself is registered. There are some exemptions in REACH, notably in the Annex 4 for specific substances and more generally in the Annex 5, and some general exemptions under the Article 2 of REACH. And then once you've done that, then you would want to calculate the tonnage because, as you may be aware or not, that REACH applies to substance manufactured or imported in quantities of one tonne or more per year. So if you're less than a tonne per year, you, um, you, you're not obliged to register the substance. And then what you would want to do is also confirm the substance identity. Um, you've probably pre-registered some time ago. It's a good time now to reflect on that and make sure the substance identity is correct so you're not in the wrong place, the wrong C for the wrong joint registration. You would prepare a draft work plan for registration, determine the resources and your budget needs, and then start communicating with the relevant colleagues. So maybe the scientific department, the marketing department, the budgetary department. And then, of course, after all this, you need to make sure you get some management support and endorsement for your plan. And then what are we talking about here? So we're talking about substances and knowing whether something is a substance is never always obvious. Um, REACH registration applies to substances, not mixtures. And a mixture is a mix or solution of two or more substances. You would register the substances, not the mixture. Um, under EU legislation, as I mentioned, mixtures are not substances. So maybe you, you have a product or a formulation. These are typical industry terms that may indicate you have a mixture. And if we look at a commercial paint, that's a typical mixture. It contains individual chemical substances. I hope this graphic illustrates it quite well. So in the first example, you basically react two chemical substances, A and B, together. Um, so they're, they're identified by the yellow and green dots, and then they form something different, and this is a substance. And this substance, C, requires registration. In the second example, you don't have this reaction taking place. They're in, I suppose you would call it like a blend or a formulation. And in this case, you don't get a new substance form, you just have a blend of two substances. And in this case, A and B would require potential registration. Tonnage calculation, um, so here you would look at a tonnage, this would determine the tonnage band and consequently the information requirement and of course the fee. Um, what you need here is to record the annual tonnage from 2007 at the beginning of REACH to the present day and a tonnage is calculated based on the, pre, the three previous years to the year you're in now. So for example, 2018 tonnage would be based on 2015, 2016, 2017 average. So you would divide this by three. But there may be cases where, of course, you're, you're just starting manufacture or you intend to manufacture, so you don't have this historical tonnage information. So it would then be the, the annual tonnage over the, cal uh, over the calendar year. So for 2018 registration, you need to be in either the 1 to 10 tonne band or the 10 to 100 tonne band. And here we have a graphic that kind of explains how this tonnage calculation works. Um, so I explain it now. So we go back to 2007 to 2010. There was no manufacturer import. Tonnage was zero. Um, but if we go to... Um, 
2014, which is the first year where you have three previous years of manufacturer import, the tonnage for 2014 is calculated based on the average of these three years, which is 19 tonnes. Similarly for 2015, which is 38 tonnes, 2016, 70 tonnes, and 2017 is 86 tonnes. And what I can highlight here is you see that 2015 was a year where the tonnage was greater than 100 tonnes per year, but the actual average tonnage was less than this. So you can still regi register in the 10 to 100 tonne per year band. So some tips. Um, have a good overview of your obligations. So look at the number of substances you have what information requirements you need to meet, um, identify the missing information, and who also is registering the substance with you. And it's very important that well in advance of the deadline that you have a plan to have all your substances that you're obligated to register by the deadline. And it's important that you communicate your intentions transparently to your customers so they can be assured of continuous supply and any, um, any solutions they need to create to, to make sure this is the case. So I will go on to this phase two now, which is find your co-registrants. And then after this point, we can take maybe some questions. So finding your co-registrants, um, it's important that you have access to your company reach IT account. So um, make sure you have the, the password and the username. In doing this, you can check whether other companies have already registered the same substance. You can also check if somebody has taken up the lead registrant role. And in this way, you can begin to initiate the contact with your co-registrants. And like I mentioned earlier, it's important that you agree on the substance identification, uh, maybe review what you pre-registered to make sure you're in the correct place. So this is the Receive page, this is where you in Reach IT, this is where you would find your co registrants. And then in the joint submission page, this is where you would find your lead registrant if one has been nominated. Um, the final couple of slides I have is introducing a new concept um, the substance identity profile. Um, this is now something that you would need to report in, in your technical registration dossier in Euclid 6. And this describes the scope of the registration. Um, in this example, we're using fruit. Um, I hope this explains it well. I can also do a chemical example as well. Um, so in this case, the registration is for apple, but there are many different shades or origins of apple, but they're still all apples. And you can see you have the red, the green, the yellow. You can compare this to different compositions of, say, a monoconstituent substance, monoconstituent substance A, or something like ethanol. They're all ethanol, but they have maybe different purities, different impurities. And the important thing here is that the, the hazard data fits to all three. So the substance identity profile is a way of transparently reporting the scope of a registration for which the hazard data fits to all. Similarly for, for, for fruit, if you look at a, a more broader scope, um, so you have fruit, the registration is for fruit, but you have different types of fruit. Um, and the same applies, the, the substance identity profile will cover the apple, the orange, and the pear, because the hazard data can fit to all three of those in the registration. And this final slide explains how the reporting would go. So uh, you have a single substance, a registration, with uh, a lead and two members. In section 1.1, they would identify in the same way, so they would share the same name and their numerical identifiers. But in section 1.2, they would report their specific composition. And in this case, you would see somebody reports apple, somebody reports apple and orange, and somebody reports orange and pear. 
but the registration is for apple, orange, and pear because the hazard data fits to that identity, that scope. So what you what you will see in Euclid 6 is this new element, this boundary composition in section 1.2. Um, and this covers all the composition, or should cover all the compositional profiles in the joint registration. So I can just stop there and maybe we have some time for questions. Yep. Yes, please. You, you would have to come up to the microphone. Yeah, sorry. Uh, good morning. My name is Ian Merbat. I'm from Desert Czech Republic. Um, thank you for the slides regarding the substance identity. I have a question regarding the boundary composition. You said it should be submitted by lead registrant covering all the potential registrants, right? Yes. So the question is how the, how the lead registrant can know the exact composition on, of every registrant because uh, for, for pure substances like benzene or sodium chloride is not a problem, but for UVCBs it could be a problem. How to, how to check uh, or how to set uh, the boundary composition in these uh, kind of situations? Yep. Thank you. Okay. So to agree on a, a boundary composition, you would have to the, the registrants would have to discuss and agree this, so there would be some sharing of information here. Um, of course, for UVCBs, the, developing a boundary composition can be a bit more challenging um, in the sense that there is an element of the composition that could be unknown. Um, and in this case, the boundary composition can maybe be a bit more generic, and other identifiers would be used to form a substance identity profile, such as uh, manufacturing process, source, etc. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you sh this should have actually happened in the sieve. So this discussion should have happened. You should have agreed a, a kind of boundary for the substance, um, so that you know all the members and the lead know that the hazard data can fit to this one boundary composition. Yes, of course, this is all nice. But uh, imagine the situation that uh, most dossiers were already, well, a lot of dossiers were already submitted in 2010. And we have agreed such kind of SIP. Yes. But now there are newcomers coming for 2018 yeah. with a little bit different profiles and doesn't meet the criteria for the, the I, I, well, let's say marker substances. So, how to how to should we exclude them from the SIP, or so should they sh should they uh, register another substance, or how to uh, made the made the SIP more broaden, or what what is your uh, what is your uh, advice for for this? Because this is the the key element here. Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, the discussion should happen, and the, the SIP should in some way be made broader to include. Um, newcomers. If the hazard data fits, of course, you can maybe only stretch it so far. Um, but this will involve discussion um, and, and some sort of agreement to to expand the, the, the SIP itself as newcomers come in with, with new compositions. But of course, you don't want to stretch it beyond what the hazard data would cover. Um, and yeah, and exactly that's the problem because we have uh, focused on something in the in the 2010 yes. on some marker substances, and now the newcomers come with another marker substances, but we did not investigate it in our substances. That's the problem. We can have it in them, yes. but we have to make uh, the whole analysis again and again, and check whether we have and check also the data if the if the testing materials contain these substances. Yes. So for us, it's much easier to exclude them from the sieve. Okay, okay, I see that. Yes, um, maybe, maybe we could. Pick. Yeah, it's very complex. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, it's just I'm just conscious of time, and certainly it's uh, it's really interesting questions you asked. But maybe we could discuss okay. after this. I think there was. The it was a okay. Question, yeah. Okay, Hello, um, Frank Reinders from DSM. I have a question about your uh, explanation about the three-year average. Yes. Uh, 
for calculating your tonnage uh, band for registration, which is obviously, obviously only applicable to phase-ins. Uh, I come across some uh, unclarity about this, while people mm -hmm. consider that uh, after you finally registered your substance, you could still apply this three-year rule, but I think if you read the legal text correctly, the three-year average is up to registration, and once you've registered, you have to immediately update your uh, dossier to a higher tonnage band if you exceed this uh, tonnage level. Is correct? Correct. Yep. That's the notes I'm getting. Yeah. <laughs> one more. Do we have time for one more question? Yeah. Hi, my name's Matt. This microphone's working. Okay. Uh, Matthew Kapetsky, U.S. Department of Commerce. My question is uh, much more basic. In the situation where you have pre-registered substances, but nobody has taken on the role of a lead registrant, and a new uh, manufacturer, new importer uh, of that same <laughs> substance uh, wants to, uh, to to join that file, uh, how do they? Uh, what do they do in that situation? Say after, how do they sort out the the, the transitioning from pre-registrant to actual registration? and uh, when no one wants to take on the lead. Javier, do you want to take that? Yes. No. no? OK, no, it is. So in that case, indeed, they all have to, to discuss and, and negotiate. At the end, someone needs to take the role. But maybe what is important is that the role of the lead registrant doesn't need to imply potentially like, like a burden. It can simply be, while well, this from the legal test, that company that actually submits the file first with the with all the joint data. So I know I know in practice maybe the lead is taking additional tasks, but uh, that doesn't need to be the case. So what I would say is that they need to all agree who is going to to be that per, that company who is going to put all the information together in the file and send it under the name of the lead. But the, the responsibilities for for everyone in the in the joint submission. So I would say that it's a game for for all. So it's not for only the that that company that decides to be the lead. This is Alam, and coming from Blendwell in Belgium. I have the same case. We have a pre sieve with many other registrants, but nobody answered. Really, I tried to uh, really to contact all the core registrants. Nobody answers, and uh, one company they have answered, but uh, they are not willing to uh, to uh, register. But they don't want to change their uh, their uh, status in uh, on reach 80, so I can't uh, take uh, the lead. And time is running. Yes, I know. And what we say in previous deadlines is that, of course, you have to do every effort to to contact the other companies and agree. But eventually, you need to take a decision. If people are not replying, then you just move ahead and prepare the registration. So if you are the only one and you have an inter you are the only one having an interest in registering that substance, I'm afraid that you will have to be to go on your own if, if, if no one else wants to participate to the registration. So don't don't wait uh, without the need for, for waiting. I mean just you you contact the different companies, you give enough time to reply, you do all your best and otherwise you move on. No, for sure, I didn't wait, really. We have started the analy analysis, but uh, the problem is um, how to, uh, how to uh, really, um, to, uh, because ECA, they, uh, they ask us on EUCLI to, uh, to, uh, to give evidence that we, are, uh, uh, we have done all our best to contact all the, the core registrants. But I, I was uh, really sending more than uh, countless emails and calls, and nobody answered, really. So uh, it's, uh, it's a burden. The, the important thing is that you have that documented and justified, and then that should be fine. So that other companies couldn't say that they actually wanted to be the lead, but they, they, you just move without them. You have that documented, that should be fine. OK, thank yeah. you. But maybe this is now the point of moving to the next mm -hmm. presentation. Otherwise, okay. we'll Thank we you very make much. It. Thank 
Thank you. So my name is Eva Valkovicho. I work in the Evaluation Directorate of ECA. And first, I will be talking to you a little bit about the sieves. So please do not bombard me with all your questions, how it's not working. Um, we then have uh, some uh, data sharing uh, colleagues in the room, then later on for replying a question. So we could, I could try with, um, I could start uh, with showing you how it should work. And uh, of course, in every sieve, what you would need to agree uh, is how to cooperate, of course. So uh, it's not only the gathering of the information and the how to, uh, in order to register, and uh, not only agreeing on the substance identity, but it is also to agree about the administrative part. Who does what, uh, how many meetings, who is handling financial issues. Then, of course, if there is a consortium about a, a similar substance, or well, not similar, the same substance, then if between the CIF and the consortium, if there is any coordination and who does it, uh, and then certainly on the communication. So which type of communication channels do you choose? Um, is it a phone? Is it emails? And so on. And then how uh, in the future uh, you would manage the newcomers. So the, the new registrants that will then come, I don't know, maybe three months before the end of the deadline. They are suddenly all the people that this lady contacted and they didn't reply three months before the deadline they will come. So you should already kind of pre-agree now what do you do then, how, wh how you try to, to manage that kind of a situation if it arises. And then, of course, um, last but not least, is then the, all the commitments beyond the registration deadline. Because as you all know, REACH stands for registration. But that's only the beginning of REACH. Then we have evaluation of the dossier, of the substance. Then we have a possible authorization, possible restriction. So by registering, uh, REACH is not finished. There are f further tasks and there are future costs that can arise from the evaluation or authorization and restriction. So already in the sieve, you could try to negotiate how you would handle certain situations. Uh, for um, what data does your sieve have? We try now uh, in ECA to create uh, some more practical examples that we will be then publishing later on uh, on our website. Uh, so you could start, of course, in the sieve by making an inventory or making a survey between all the all the co-registrants or the pre sieve members on what, which type of data do they have. So, for example, here we have a registrant A, registrant B, registrant C. Uh, registrant C seems that he doesn't have any data and therefore he would then need uh, uh, all the data uh, to be shared or to be to buy all the data from the sieve. Like this, then you compare all the information that all the sieve uh, is having, is owning, uh, to the information requirements of the Annex 7, even in case you register, when you want to register substance between 1 to 10 tons, or uh, Annex 7 and Annex 8, in case it's a substance from 10 to 100 tons. And then you identify which are the data gaps that you still have. Then uh, we come to the topic of cost sharing. So you, uh, I would like to mention that in this example, the costs are very fictive. So don't take them for granted, as Eka said, that for literature search you have to pay 20,000. These are very uh, uh, illusionary examples, just to illustrate some kind of how it could work. So let's consider that we have uh, uh, that one uh, re registrant has is owning a study that has cost 160,000, and then as you can see on the slide, you could add a certain other things like, for example, the literature search, monitoring of the progress of how the study is going, financial management or scientific assessment then of the results of the study. Then let's say that you end up with 200,000. And if we consider that you have, for example, seven uh, members of the CIF, 
the easiest way, of course, how to split the cost would be to divide it by seven, which would then mean that the uh, that all the seven members would be the uh, data owners. They would own the whole study as such. However, in certain circumstances, of course, the, um, you can decide in the CIF that you don't want to own the whole study because you will only need it for each registration. You will not uh, need this data for any other uh, regulatory purposes. Or, and that you could, for example, have it as a only right to refer. So in the first, in the first um, uh, type, you have the right to refer and you can apply so-called cost factors. So you could see that, let's say, fictive numbers again, you could say that uh, you deduct 50% uh, because you would then only have the right to refer, so you would not be the owner of the, of the data. So that uh, brings the sum down to 100,000. Then you can have the discount for each only use. So you have the right to refer to this data and only for each purposes, for no other EU legislation or non-EU legislations. You deduct again 30,000. Then in certain sieves we have seen that uh, they are so-called risk premiums or inflation, few percentages for inflation. In our example, we have zero because some countries had deflation. So you could, but these are the things that the sieve could negotiate then when, whenever you are doing the cost uh, sharing negotiations. So let's say we have a 71,000 as a sum, and then we split that by seven and you have 10,000 which is then the so-called letter of access, and that is for this one particular endpoint. So then you would kind of need to do a similar exercise for all the other endpoints. Or in certain cases, and certain sieves, you, especially for the ones that have already registered for the previous deadlines, they have already had this calculated for you and they could offer you a lower letter of access for all the data that you could need for Annex 7, let's say, for a certain price. But then you should always uh, check how they derived uh, this price. So if it's too cheap, it can be fishy. The data maybe is not of the highest quality and you may end up in then having, uh, needing to be paying more because uh, ECA will pick the uh, substance for dossier evaluation. If it's too expensive, then of course it's in your interest to know why it has cost uh, that much. And then in the cost uh, sharing and data sharing, of course the main logo or the, the, the main slogan is always that the cost, they need to be shared in a, in a fair, transparent and non-discriminatory way. And you all have right to know how that costs were derived. And you can of course always challenge these costs. So what you need to pay for is only the data that you really need for your registration. It depends on your tonnage band. Uh, it depends on the type of registration, whether you are having an intermediate, whether you are having a full registration. In certain, uh, uh, certain moments, you can also decide to opt out from the joint, uh, jointly submitted data in case that you have your own equivalent data in case you consider that the joint data is not of sufficient quality. However, we would like to avoid these type of situations because these kind of things should be discussed in the CIV and CIV together should decide to, of course, provide the best data for, for the joint submission. And then in case that you do opt out, of course, then in your member dossier, you need to include the, this endpoint for which you are opting out. Now in this slide we have an example for costs that you would need to pay for or for data that you would need to pay for. We have uh, four different registrations dossiers, let's say. In the uh, first one you have from one to 10 tons and this uh, member would need the Annex 7 FISCAM and would need the Annex 7 ECOTOX and TOX uh, FATE because he is registering only from one to 10 tons. So these costs or this data, he would need to buy, let's consider he, we, he doesn't have any. But then always there are the administration costs and the token. So this is not to be forgotten that um, 
it uh, it requires or it takes quite some uh, money resources also uh, the overall administration and preparing of the Euclid dossier and uh, and uh, assessing and so on. So for the administration, I have here a note, it includes costs uh, that are related to the overall CIV, CIV administration that cannot be really allocated to a certain endpoint, but uh, an overall, then of course the CIV communication, different surveys, uh, or CIF website and financial management of CIF. And the more information you can uh, find in the data sharing guidance. Now, as you can see then for the, for the last uh, example, the transported isolated intermediates under strictly controlled conditions. For example, these type of substances, they need to provide only information that is readily available to them. That means they don't need to buy extra data or make uh, extra data. However, they would still, and they still need to uh, submit jointly. So they, uh, they would uh, then need to pay the administration cost and the token cost. Um, for as tips, of course, for data sharing, we know in ECA that it, that is, it is not easy. It takes uh, mm, a lot of negotiations. And uh, what we always advise is, of course, to make every effort to reach an agreement. And the, these, the costs need to be determined in the fair, transparent, and non-discriminatory way. And as a last resort, uh, in, on the ECA website, uh, we have um, one part where you can submit a dispute to ECA in case that you, uh, that you feel that you have done all the effort uh, but the lead registrant or the CIF uh, in general don't uh, take your uh, view into account and they, uh, it seems to you that they do not, uh, they are not fair and not transparent and, and they are discriminatory. Now on the website from our, um, uh, from our experience, uh, from the disputes, we have uh, collected some do's and don'ts. So basically you will find all these on our website. The most important one being be reliable, consistent and open in all the negotiations. So don't just say, no, this is too expensive. I'm not gonna pay. Try to understand what are the real costs. Try to negotiate with the already existing sieves and so on. Now I won't go through all of these. I will not read them aloud, but um, these are the the ones that we have uh, thought um, or that we have seen in the real life situations. And of uh, you should be of course concrete in your, if you disagree with the proposed offer and then also you should reason why do you disagree. Then we of course have the don'ts and now the don'ts I will um, say aloud <laughs> because those are important. So certainly do not expect that uh, the other party or someone will do the work for you. As we have already heard today, the joint submission is a joint effort of all co-registrants. So it's not only the lead to do the work, it's not only the consultant that you hire, that now you hire him and you just let everything on him, check constantly with him how far is he with the with the work, uh, does he need any more input from you so that then you don't uh, end up in a situation that three months before the deadline, there is nothing ready. Then of course, give a, don't give unreasonable timeframes uh, to complete any negotiations, so always allow enough time. Don't disclose confidential and commercial sensitive information and don't ignore the, the costs that are there for the for the time and the resources and uh, of the involved negotiations within the CIFs. Now we have more don'ts. So don't delay, don't send confusing signals and don't ignore raised issues. And as the last, don't, negoti don't negotiate prices without considering the objective criteria. So now I stop with the don'ts. <laughs> I feel like in school or like with my children, don't, don't, don't. <laughs> and now we come to the uh, phase four, which is the hazard, uh, assess hazards and risk. So this is the field that I am uh, more responsible for in ECA. 
And uh, here, um, what I would want to say that, of course, these two phases, the phase four and the phase three, uh, they are kind of interlinked, so you can't really separate them. Of course, if you are in the sieve uh, negotiating the costs and the prices and uh, who needs what, you have basically already needed to do this assessment of or collecting information. So you had to already check within your um, internal resources in the literature, in the publicly available information. You had to ask your customers already about the uses that they are, uh, that they are using the substance for. And then you have already done the survey within the sieve, who needs what and who has what, and how you have identified the data gaps. Now, what you can also do is, uh, in the sieve discussion, you can check the similar substances. So that means uh, there might be a very similar substance that is of a similar structure and behaves very similarly to your substance, for which, for example, there is already a registration with a full data set. So you could try to see if you can use the data from this similar substance in the so-called read-across approach for your, for your own substance. Then uh, uh, certainly in case you would need to make a, a vertebrate animal test, you should consider the alternative methods for filling in the data gaps. Or if we say an alternative, we also mean, for example, a QSR calculation. So you will have later on the QSR toolbox uh, presentation. You can use that one instead of testing. Uh, but you also always need to very well justify in the dossier that the substance is a good substance to to be to use the the cues arm then if more information is needed then um, of course you need to agree in the sieve how now you proceed which alternative methods you use or whether you do the testing in case you do test, then of course you need to procure, you have to order the test. We have re heard recently that the testing laboratories' uh, capacities uh, are, are low, uh, for especially for the higher tests. Then you need to analyze, of course, the test results. Once you have the test with the toxicologist or ecotoxicologist, you need to conclude on the hazards and risk. Then, if a classification and labeling is necessary, of course you need to uh, you need to do that. In case you need a chemical safety assessment, then you need to conduct it. If you need to then uh, report it in the chemical safety report, of course, then to also today later on you will have uh, you will see Kessar and how to use it, and then uh, of course to discuss all these things in the consortium. Um, starting, well, this is a little bit uh, coming back to the what information requirements there they are actually are. So for the substances from 1 to 10 tons, you already know by now that in Annex 7 of REACH, you have all the information requirements that you need. It's mostly the physical chemical properties and then some ecotoxicological, some toxicological properties and uh, only one vertebrate animal endpoint, which is the acute toxicity oral. Now, when you go uh, further to the tonnage band between 10 to 100 tons, you have to comply with the Annex 7 and plus the Annex 8 requirements. So I have chosen the easiest example, of course. Let's, um, let's see that, um, or let's uh, check only the physical chemical data. You have done the analysis in your company and you see that you have the, the certain data or even in the sieve. Then you have compared uh, with the section seven of annex seven and you found out that you are still missing the four, the boiling point, vapor pressure, water solubility and the um, partition coefficient octanal water. So how is your thinking then forwarding? You check in column two of uh, every of the reach annex. So for you now in annex seven, in the column two, you would check the so-called adaptations. So there are certain possibilities how you can omit, how you, you don't need to do the test. So let's say you know that your substance is a solid substance with melting point of 350 degrees. So that means you don't need to provide the information on boiling point and you don't need to um, provide the information on vapor pressure. So like this, you already have two tests less. Now you still need the water solubility and you need the partition coefficient. 
and that you can then always check on, you do a literature search, you do the public databases, or then you agree in the sieve that you would need to actually generate the data and you order a test. We have released a practical guide for SME managers and reach coordinators, which is also available in all uh, your languages, which is in an uh, easy way uh, explaining all the information requirements. So in, you could explain to your managers if they don't really find it important that uh, you sh you should your company should register the substance or something. Then it explains in uh, easy words why are these important and what they really are. Now, as I was talking about the adaptations or omitting the test so that you don't need to uh, you need to don't you don't need to always provide a test. There are certain ways, and a certain uh, physical chemical uh, properties of the substance where a a certain tests are not needed. So we call these adaptations or waiving options or waiving possibilities. They are stipulated in column two of each of the annexes, or then in annex eleven, which we call these general rules, and they are based on a well-documented and science-based justifications. The most common ones from these are the, are the weight of evidence. This would be that you have um, uh, more independent data, which none of them could be good enough on its own to be a key study. But all together, in, in you, you assess it and you evaluate it in a way that y it actually does uh, give you a certain uh, certainty that your substance does or does not have a certain property. Then you can, of course, use the QSAR models. Then there are the in vitro methods. And then the grouping of substances and read across. Those are the ones that I mentioned that you can use data from similar substances to fill in uh, your data gaps for your substance. Talking about the uh, assessment of the data quality, what is very important is that each piece of information on your, on your substance that you collect, you assess on whether it is adequate, whether it is relevant, and whether it is reliable. So the adequacy is the usefulness of the information for the hazards and the risk assessment. For the relevance, it is the extent to which the data and tests are appropriate for a particular hazard identification. So let's say if you need uh, long-term tests on, uh, I don't know, Daphnia, you can not have a test that lasts 96 hours. It needs to be a long-term test, which would be 21 days. So uh, this is how you assess that. And then, of course, the data needs to be reliable. We are using the so-called so CLIMI scores from one, when one is the best, and four is the one not even assignable, because you are not sure about um, about how the data was done and what is the really what is the quality of the data. Um, then overall, of course, you um, you are collecting all the information um, that you need and uh, into your registration dossier um, in order to register. However, of course, that is not the main aim even though now, of course, it is your main aim to submit the registration. But the main aim of REACH is um, to assess the hazards and the risks of the chemical substances and show that you are using the, that you know the substance and that you are using it in a safe way. Um, so here, basically, this uh, is a very basic slide, just explaining that the risk is actually the hazard time, times and exposure. Um, and uh, you then document the risk in a chemical safety assessment. You would need to do a chemical safety assessment if you manufacture or import um, more than 10 tons of the substance. So if you are the lower um, tonnage band, then you would not need to do it. You, in case you are in the lower tonnage band, you need to um, provide the information on use and exposure and the guidance on, a sa on safe use. 
Then in the higher tonnage band between 10 and 100 tons, you need to do the hazard assessment and the PBT and VPVB assessment, which is the persistent bioaccumulative and toxic uh, assessment. If your substance is already classified or it is already known PBT or VPVB, then you also need to provide the exposure assessment, exposure scenarios, and risk characterization. And as already mentioned before, there is this um, IT tool called Kessar that you will see later on today you know, that you can use to, uh, to create your chemical safety assessment and your chemical safety report. Um, the tool is very useful for the fact that it uh, collaborates directly with Euclid, so you don't have to type in the data again and again. Um, now, I skip a slide. Here we are. Um, this is the guide for SME managers and um, reach coordinators that I have already mentioned. Um, so it really explains how to fulfill the information requirements for the tonnages from 1 to 10 and 10 to 100. And uh, we tried our best to, to have the, the simple explanations of each of the endpoints. Uh, on our website then, in the REACH 2018 section, um, we also have some, um, uh, some more practical information about, for example, what could be the possible costs of certain, of, of certain tests, what are the amounts, for example, of a test substance that you should send to the laboratory, uh, and then also the considerations that uh, very often when you are already deciding which test you need, um, you can send it as, a, or you can, um, you can agree with the test laboratory that they do it in like a batch thing, so not, not starting with one and then uh, later on sending something else. Um, but it, it would be uh, done at once. Of course, then certain studies, they depend on each other. So for certain uh, endpoints, uh, you would then maybe later on only need to continue with certain tests. And now considering that we would have all the information already, you have collected all the data that you need and you would need to create your dossier. So that's why you are here today because you will learn more about Euclid, Reach IT, or the cloud services as Christelle, our director for registration, was having in, uh, on her T-shirt. So the cloud service is something new um, uh, coming, and it should ease the uh, it should ease your life. So we hope it will. And of course, you always need to make sure that you have the, the access codes to all the tools that you have chosen. Now, for uh, uh, once you, like, in order to prepare the registration, also, of course, you have to type in all the data, whether you choose Euclid or the Euclid Cloud or the, all, all the online reach IT. Uh, in all of the tools now, we have um, many pick lists that you just need to choose. For example, for the waving options, for the waving adaptations, you don't need to anymore type it yourself. But we have a pick list that you just choose the correct one so that then when you are trying to pass the technical completeness check, it, it, it is easier uh, for you to pass. Of course, to pass the te technical completeness check, then we always advise to use the validation assistant. And then if, in case you would want to have a view on which data would be disseminated, we have the dissemination plugin that we also advise you to use. Then um, uh, we would be more or less uh, at the end. So in order to submit your registration, you have to agree within the CIF on the timing on uh, when the lead registrant then creates the joint submission in Reach IT, he will get a token. He needs to provide you the token, and then you submit your member dossier with, with having the token. And you will hear more about it today for sure. Then uh, once you submit the registration uh, dossier, we have the so-called technical completeness check, as I mentioned already, so there, uh, we are checking whether whether the data that you have submitted are uh, are okay. Let's say so. We are. It's not a compliance check. We are not exactly checking every endpoint for every information that you have provided. But it's a basic set of checks that has to 
uh, it has to be fulfilled in order for us to grant you the registration number. In case that you fail the technical completeness check, you receive from ECA a letter explaining exactly why you failed the TCC. So therefore, you have to carefully check the letter, uh, change th these things in your uh, in your registration dossier, and then resubmit by the given deadline or earlier. And then, of course, to pay the fee within the established deadline, because without paying the fee, you will never get the registration. And then uh, we have uh, published the REACH, 2000 on, uh, REACH 2018. All these information are online together with uh, a lot of practical guides and these practical examples plus the uh, webinars that we have done for every phase. You have there also a little uh, clicking uh, clock which is now stopped at 422 because I took the screenshots a few days ago. So today it's already less than 422. <laughs> and then what we would like to also share with you is that we will be having um, the Rich 2018 Spring School. So block in your calendars between 15 and 19 of May. We will be rerunning all the webinars that we did for all, every of the phase. And we will have a live Q&A chat. So that means you can, uh, if you register to these uh, webinars again, you will have the opportunity to ask uh, us live questions. We will have a new webinar, which is called Getting Your Chemical Safety Assessment Done. And this one will happen on the 17th of May. And on our website, you can already see the, you can already find the registration link uh, in order to register for this one. So then uh, we will also be still uh, publishing the pra more practical examples and we will be publishing the animated videos that you have seen uh, in the very beginning. So we will have uh, an animated video for every phase. So please do save the date, uh, 15, 19 May. And then uh, with this, I thank you very much for your attention. And in case you have any questions, please don't be afraid and come to the microphones. First. Good morning, Hans Nassan with Galata Chemicals. I have a question about the registration of uh, intermediate under strictly controlled conditions. And I refer to one of your slides where you said uh, you only need to pay for what you need. So for the uh, intermediates under strictly controlled conditions, you need only the data which are available to you. Yes. If you join an existing uh, registration, while well, you have to, to join this registration. No opt-out is possible, I think. And uh, if there is a, is a lot of data available for this substance, uh, do you have to pay for all these uh, data or just for the token which you uh, mentioned on your slide? Yes, it's the yes. slide here. So Reed says, of course, you need to submit all available information. And by this, all available, meaning available to you without further payment for this case of strictly controlled conditions uh, intermediates. So if you yourself have the data already, you are the data owner, then you shall submit them. But if you do not own them, you, sh you shall not <coughs> buy them and you should not pay for them in the CIF. You should only pay for the administration and the token. Okay, so, so in um, case you are in negotiations with, with, with your CIF, then you need to ask for the cost breakdown of what if they offered you, for example, a letter of access, which costs blah, blah then you need to ask that you would want to see only the ones, uh, only the costs that are administrative costs, not uh, the costs for, for each endpoint. And then, of course, the cost of the token. Okay. So in the extreme case, you would register with an empty dossier, so to say? Well, you never register with an empty dossier. <laughs> you always need to have certain information in your dossier, so certainly all information about your company, your substance identification, your uses, well, in this case, strictly control yeah. conditions, and so on. And, um, yeah, that would be but, it. But no FISCAM and, and, and ECOTOX or TOX data? No. So in extreme case? In extreme case. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. More questions? We have here lady and then the man in the green. 
déportation. So Florence Lecomte from Marista Life Science. Um, I would like to know um, what, in which extent, we have obligation to answer a CIF member which would like to join one month uh, before the deadline, because uh, it's a lot of uh, work for uh, lead registrant. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, what is uh, what are obli our our obligation? Well, good question. Anybody from registration, Javier, do you want to take this one? Yes, so this is Javier Sanchez from registration. So, well, I would say that indeed you have to reply to, to that member, but it's of course not your responsibility that he will have to meet the deadline if he comes very close to the deadline. So I would say you reply to him, to that company as you would reply to any other company. You you put it in your in your planning and then well, if they if they contacted you too late, well, then they're going to be probably too late. I think that's uh, that's what we can say. Hopefully, they would then agree to just buy the letter of faxes and fastly process the registration. So, in that case, of course, it's easy. In case they start the negotiations, then as it as it goes. Hi, I'm, I'm Sean Marr. I'm a an OR, uh, Euro Safety and Health Zero company. And we represent oh, half a dozen micro enterprises and SMEs. And I did initial check for some of these letters of access, and they're 40 and 50,000 euros. And these companies are importing into Europe maybe a few thousand a year. And so essentially, all these companies are going to be shut out of the market. And this is just my half dozen. I'm sure there's hundreds, if not thousands, of companies that are going to be out of business. Uh, I see this as the end of the SME and microenterprise. Would it be advantageous for them all just to go out of business and then come back in 2020 and say, oh, it's already registered, we'll use that? That is, of course, a um, uh, market uh, solution. You, that is everybody's choice, how, uh, how they feel uh, appropriate. It just it so seems unfair to me really that... Much uh, comment on this, of yeah. course. It's a business solution. But that would work, wouldn't it? Well, it depends in which circumstances, of course. Right. They would most probably, well, it depends if the data is then um, available. There are, I mean, the companies I represent, every one of them, they're all common substances that are registered in the initial go round. And, and now they're just going to have to essentially a uh, Fortune 100 company for permission, essentially, to sell their chemical in a mixture. I mean, it just seems unfair. Javier? Yeah, just to add that, of course, first of all, you shouldn't just simply accept that that's the price. Mm -hmm. I was, we said before, yeah, if I will be in the situation of those companies, I will start first like inquiring where these costs come from, if they could have a breakdown and then to make sure that that's actually what you have to pay for or there is any, any room there for maneuver or maybe even misunderstandings. But at the end, as you say, it's, a, it's also a business decision. I mean, if the cost is what, it's, what, it, what it is and it's not financially, financially worthy for the company, well, a business decision needs to be made. Mm 